Okay, let's finish off chapter 21 on superposition. Today I want to talk about interference in one dimension. So what we're looking at here is two waves, uh, sinusoidal waves from different sources which are traveling in the same direction. And this speaker 2 wave goes right past speaker 1 and uh, both waves add up over here at the point of detection where we're listening to it. And so this is called interference. So the math looks like this. You've got any sinusoidal waves, A times sine Kx minus omega t plus phi sub zero. K is the wave number, omega is the angular frequency of the wave, and phi sub zero is the phase constant. And it tells us what the source is doing at t equals zero. So for example, here's a snapshot of this wave at time t equals zero. So if phi sub zero equals zero radians, then this looks like just a normal sine wave that starts uh, at the origin. Uh, so this is when the speaker cone uh, is at its equilibrium position, and I think it'll be moving backwards. Over here, this crest was emitted a quarter cycle ago. It's moving towards the right at speed v. And when it was emitted, the speaker cone was all the way towards the right, and it was uh, creating a maximum displacement of the air particles. Uh, here's uh, a wave with the same frequency and wave number, but now a different phase constant, pi over 2. So since the phi phase constant is pi over 2, at t equals 0, this sine wave is now uh, displaced to the left by a quarter of a cycle. And so here is now this crest happening at t equals 0 at, and x equals 0. This is when the speaker cone is all the way to uh, forward, and this crest will now move towards the right. So here we have two waves. They have the same frequency and wave number, k and omega. They have the same amplitude, lowercase a, uh, but they may or may not have different phase constant. So if the phase constants are such that the waves are in phase, that means that the crests or the wave fronts from wave one are lined up with the wave fronts from wave two. And in fact, uh, these over here at the, to the right of speaker one, the displacement from, from speaker one is equal to the displacement from speaker two for all values of x. And that makes the resulting uh, wave a sine wave, again, but now with amplitude 2a. And this is called maximum constructive interference. Now, if these two phase constants are differing by uh, pi or 3 pi or something, this means these are out of phase. So the wave fronts from wave 1 are halfway between the wave fronts from wave 2. So this crest matches up with the trough from wave 2. And then when you add them up, you find that d1 is equal to negative d2 for all values of x, and you get perfect destructive interference. You actually get silence when you combine these two sound waves, you hear nothing. So, in general, the math looks like this. You're adding uh, two different phases, phi 1, which is kx1 minus omega t plus phi 1 sub 1 0, and then plus a sine phi 2, where this is phi 2. We can use a trigonometric identity to write this sum as uh, being a sine wave, sine kx average minus omega t plus the average of these two uh, phase constants, all times this amplitude 2a cos delta phi over 2, where delta phi is the phase difference. So what matters when you're adding these two waves is the difference between their phases, delta phi. That will determine what the amplitude of the final wave is. So there's that equation again. And first example, uh, maximum constructive er interference would be when this uh, amplitude here, co which depends on cos delta phi over 2, is maximum, so it's when it's plus or minus 1. So cosine of phi over, or delta phi over 2 is maximum when delta phi is equal to m times 2 pi, where m is some integer, 0, 1, 2, or negative 1, negative 2, etc., etc. So uh, that's maximum amplitude. The amplitude will be zero when this cosine function is zero, and that's perfect destructive interference, sorry, when delta phi is equal to m plus a half 
times 2 pi, where again, m is an integer. So, for example, half times 2 pi pi, that will cause destructive interference. Or 1 and a half times 2 pi, that will be 3 pi, etc. So all the odd uh, multiples of pi. So here are two speakers that are in phase, and they're located one wavelength apart. Okay, so the distant, uh, difference in distance, uh, delta x, between uh, a single observer way over to the right will be lambda. Delta x equals lambda. That means that these two waves end up being in step. You have constructive interference. So the final amplitude uh, will be 2a, where little a is the, uh, is the amplitude of either wave. If you have two sources of identical wavelength that are half a wavelength apart, delta x is uh, lambda over 2, this path difference, then you have perfect destructive interference. So the amplitude will be 0. And of course it's, impossible, it's possible that these two waves are neither exactly in phase or out of phase. They could be off by, say, 40 degrees or 90 degrees or 160 degrees. In each case, you have the green line adding with the red line to form a sum, which is the blue line. This blue line could be sort of somewhat constructive, uh, as it's shown here, or somewhat destructive. The final sum is a little bit less. But it's always a sine wave is the final answer. And uh, the amplitude of that sine, waves, it, sine wave is determined by delta phi, the phase difference between uh, the two waves that are summing up. So there's neat applications of interference. One of them is thin film optical coatings. Uh, and you may have heard of these as being anti-reflection coatings you can get for glasses, if you wear glasses. So the way that works is you have uh, glass, and then uh, deposited on the surface of the glass is a, a transparent coating that has a different index of refraction than the glass. So you have this wave, the light wave that um, hits the glass. It first thing that happens is that it hits the uh, optical coating, and since this optical coating has a different index of refraction than air, then there's some light that's reflected and some light that is transmitted into the coating. Then it hits the hits the glass, the transmitted part of the wave hits the glass, and again, since there's a difference in uh, index or refraction of the glass and the coating, part of the wave is transmitted and part of the wave is reflected. So this reflected wave comes back out and some of it is transmitted back out into the air, and depending on the thickness of this uh, optical coating, you can have either constructive or destructive interference of the, these two reflected waves. The wave reflected off the front surface of the coating and the back surface of the coating will interfere as it goes back towards the observer. And so here are two glasses, two sets of glasses. One has an anti-reflection coating and one does not. This uh, coating on the top set has been uh, Determine, ha, has a certain thickness so that you always have destructive interference of those two reflective waves. So the phase difference between two reflected waves is 2 pi times n times d over lambda, where n is the index of refraction of the coating and d is the thickness of that coating. And lambda is the wavelength of the light that you, you're trying to um, make interfere or not interfere uh, in air. So if you want constructive interference to actually maximize reflection, then you want to set uh, lambda c, the, the wavelength that you're looking at, equal to 2 n d over m. So set your d to satisfy this equation. If you want destructive interference, like shown with these glasses, then you set the d to satisfy this equation, where here lambda is the wavelength of the light, n is the index of refraction of the coating, and m, again, is uh, some integer, and d is the thickness of the coating. So now let's look at two-dimensional waves. Here you have uh, a source, and it's emitting some wave. This graph shows the displacement of the medium versus distance in this particular direction. Uh, and then these wave fronts are showing where all the crests are, because this wave is emitting out in all directions r. r is the distance uh, between any point and the source, measured outward from the source, and this amplitude, little a, actually decreases as you get further and further away from the source. And so 
uh, an example of this would be uh, ripples on a uh, surface of water. This would be two-dimensional water waves going out from two from one place or two places. So I have a little sim simulation I want to show you before we move on. So here is a Java applet uh, provided by MIT uh, in which you can simulate two-dimensional waves. So here we have an oscillator uh, emitting sinusoidal waves uh, centered at this point. You can see that uh, the wave fronts are shown as these gray areas and as the waves get further and further away from the source the intensity gets less and less. Now let's put a second wave source right here. And these two wave sources are oscillating in phase and uh, they're separated by about uh, one, two, three, four wavelengths. So halfway in between them you can see a point of constructive interference where you get these dark patches. And this uh, creates an, uh, an antinodal line. So the antinodal line is uh, running horizontally here where you see the antinodes or maximum um, points of constructive interference. And then right above it you can see this white line is a nodal line. This is where there is always uh, destructive interference from the two waves. So you're always a uh, half wavelength difference in path length between uh, this source and this source. Then there's another antinodal line with constructive interference. Here you can see another nodal line curving around this white patch here. And uh, I believe up here there's another uh, antinodal line. And here is figure 21.30 uh, from page 612 of your textbook showing a snapshot schematic of exactly that same animation I just showed you. So you have two sources that are oscillating in phase. Uh, there's circular wave fronts. The green ones are showing uh, the wave fronts going away from the green source. Blue lines showing the wave fronts emanating from the blue source. Uh, you can see now that these sources are actually four half wavelengths apart, not four wavelengths, but I guess two wavelengths apart. And now the red lines you can see are the antinodal lines of constructive interference, and the black lines are the nodal lines of destructive interference. And the way the math works out for solving problems for this is very similar to the math for interference in one dimension, except now instead of delta x you have delta r, the difference in distance between uh, wherever you're listening, the observer, and the two sources. So you have maximum constructive interference or an antinodal line when uh, this delta phi, which is 2 pi delta r over lambda plus the, d the phase difference of the two sources, is equal to some integer times 2 pi. That's uh, constructive. Uh, destructive interference is m plus a half times 2 pi. And <clears throat> in both these equations, delta r is the path length difference, and m is some integer, 0, 1, 2, etc. And lastly, I want to talk about beats. So this was the first slide uh, today. And remember, we're looking at interference from two sources uh, two traveling waves that are going in the same direction. And up until now, we've assumed that the frequency of these two waves is the same. But for beats, now the frequency is slightly different. And this is what ends up happening. You have uh, the medium oscillating at some average frequency, but the amplitude is slowly modulated by this modulation frequency. So you get loud, soft, loud, soft. And I'll, I'll work through a description of, of uh, how this works. Okay, so beats is a phenomenon that arises when two waves, such as sound waves, have almost identical frequencies, but not exactly the same. So here's two tuning forks, each generating a sound pressure wave, and the frequencies of the two forks are slightly different. We're going to be interested in this region, in, uh, surrounded by the red circle here, where the two sound waves overlap. So let's think about periodic motion. Here we have two drums. It's down a bit. Uh, the two drums are being hit at slightly different rates. This upper snare drum is being struck at a higher rate, so higher frequency, than the bass drum. When the scene was first entered, 
they were being struck simultaneously, just like now. Every 20 seconds ago, uh, every sec 20 seconds or so, they are again struck simultaneously because they're again in phase with each other. Now they're out of phase. 10 seconds later. Another 10 seconds later, they'll be in phase again. And there they go, in phase. So here's two oscillators now, one and two, whose uh, periods are uh, double the times between the striking of the two drums in the previous scene. So, and this blue ball shows the amplitude of these two oscillators uh, summed up, one plus two. And just as with the drums, when the scene was first entered, the two oscillators were in phase, and at that time, the amplitude of this blue ball was twice the amplitude of each oscillator, was maximum. And then, 20 seconds later, uh, they're out of phase, and so the blue ball doesn't move at all. And then, 20 seconds after that, the oscillators are again in phase with each other. So here they are in phase. If you wait a little bit longer, after 20 seconds, you'll see the oscillators will be uh, out of phase, and the blue ball will stop moving. Almost there. Ah, there they go. Now the blue ball stops moving for just a sec, and then it'll start moving again. And the way you can visualize this, here you have a sine wave uh, and an added to another sine wave, same frequency, but they're just, uh, oh, sorry, same starting point, but to slightly different frequencies. When you add them up, you get this uh, blue line, which is uh, it's about the same frequency as either of them, but the average frequency of these two waves. But then uh, it's modulated by uh, this uh, modulation, which is at a lower frequency. It's the difference between the two frequencies. It's loud and then soft, and then loud and then soft. And here's the way the math works. You go to omega 1 for this sine wave, omega 2 for this sine wave. When you add them up, you get a sine wave. Uh, the blue line has an oscillation of the average uh, of omega 1 plus omega 2. So that's the average. And then it's modulated by the difference, omega 1 minus omega 2 uh, over 2. And the way this sounds, uh, you can generate sound waves here. If you click on button 1, you've got a 440 hertz sound wave. Oh. If you click on button 2, you get a 442, slightly higher frequency. I don't know if you can hear the difference there. I can't. But if you add or, or click both buttons at once, you get this sound. So it's, again, it sounds like 440 hertz, maybe 441 hertz, but there's this beating. So it beats every two seconds, where two hertz is now the beat frequency. Let's play it again. 